Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and welcome to our weekly uh, extract from the sermon in our exciting episode of the, the Bash magazine. Today, we are going to speak about the Parsha Pinchas. And as every Shabbat, we are sharing this extract for those of you which haven't been able to join us in person as well as to give you the opportunity to be part of the CLAL, uh, the community, and to support the Debash magazine personally through your uh, donations and through the chance of uh, giving uh, practically what uh, Hashem is asking to do personally. So if you wish to uh, support the Debash magazine, that is entirely devoted to the next generation, you can do it simply clicking on the link below this video and support the next generation Torah learning through the Debash magazine. We both offer um, the chance to uh, receive your copy of the Devash magazine every week as a PDF file, so as an electronic copy or as a print job. So you can ask for one of the two or both of them uh, via email at contact at org. And the Devash magazine is the first fruit of the um, Kadima project that started last year as we celebrate next September, one year of the Karima project and the Bash magazine. That is a program devoted to uh, families with children from three years of age up to 12 years of age. And it's a time of preparation for those of you which are willing to learn more about Torah and sharing the Torah learning with your children. As um, first educators, parents and grandparents and old family is called to share what uh, we have been learned with our children and children of children so that we can pass the baton and the Torah learning we have received from Hashem as well in a practical way. So before we start today, let's pray together. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we come before your throne to ask you for forgiveness of all sins we made against your will. And we ask you for courage, strength, zeal, according to your will in our lives so we might stand in times of trials in times of tribulation and we might be ready as well as it was for Yehoshua to lead others to your faith in Moshiach Yeshua amen so Shabbat Shalom everyone as we start our uh, program today we um, introduce the three afterot of the three weeks preceding the nine of Av. For those of you interested to participate to the three weeks preceding the nine of Av uh, preparation plan, you can always contact us via email at contact at makaseshatkiba.org and join us in prayers and fasting. So these three aftarot or the three weeks preceding the nine of Av are called Shalosh for Anutas Shal. That means in Hebrew, the three aftarot of punishment. These three weeks precede the nine of Av that is a uh, recording uh, and is um, remembering, sorry, remembering of the first temple destruction. So you can to uh, dedicate a Parsha or any other section of Torah uh, portion as part of the Debash magazine. 
in memory or in honor of someone close to you. For further information, you can write to us at contact at makaseshatikva.org. Then we're going to have Shabbat Mevarchim, Kodesh Menachem Av Rosh Kodesh on a Friday, July 29th, 2022. And this week we studied the chapter one of Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers. So as I always say, please look at the scriptural references below the video so you might be able to read the scriptural references for this Parsha with your children and family during this time of the weekend where you can use wisely any minute with your uh, family. So it's time to avenge Hashem's honor and Moshe gathers thousand men from each tribe for a rumble with Midian. Under the leadership of Bilhas, 12,000 soldiers of Bnei Israel wipe out all the men of Midian. But when the Jewish soldiers bring back the Midianite women with the booty, Moshe closes the cloud of glory for seven days. And there is a revenge rituals and tax residuals in this exciting episode of the Vash magazine. In this uh, Parsha, we have six mitzvot, six mitzvot ase, which are positive commandment, and zero um, mitzvot lotase, that means negative commandments. Then we have 168 Pesukim, or sentences, and 1,887 number of words, 7,853 letters. And the Aftorah, uh, that is the additional portion pro from the prophets, which is read after the Parsha, comes from Irmiyahu, that is the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through chapter 2, Verse 3. So Pincus makes a sharp point. We already anticipated the figure of Pincus in the uh, previous Parsha that I invite you to listen to through the SoundCloud channel, but also to watch as part of our YouTube channel video from last week. So in our last episode last week a new superhero appeared Pinchas a son of Eleazar grandson of Aaron so he comes from a priestly inheritance from a priestly uh, background while Moshe and the judges stood stand at Zimri's red rendezvous stood um, with a Moabite woman woman Pinchas rushed into Zimri's tent and pierced a spear through both of them. So he didn't wait for anyone to tell him, hey, is it something right to do? Or maybe it's not. Maybe Hashem will not be pleased with what you're doing. No, Pinchas just did it. And let's see how it went. As our Parsha opens, there is a controversy in the camp. In fact, Zimri is not just some sinner of the street. He is a Nasi, a prince of Israel and a leader of his tribe. So Pinchas, on the other hand, is a descendant of Ethro on his mother's side. So Ethra was an idol worshiper before Moshe came along. How can the descendant of an idol worshiper kill a Nazi or a prince? In Hashem's name, Moshe declares that Pinchas has single-handedly saved the Jews from a plague that would have wiped out all the Bnei Israel. Not only was Pinchas right about killing Zimri, but he has earned extra points for quick thinking and taking personal risk. As I said, he didn't wait for others to say if 
what he was doing was right or wrong. So thanks to Pinchas, a great Hilul Hashem, that is something prohibited by Hashem, has been avoided. As, as, um, as a meaning from Hebrew, Hilul Hashem is not only something that is prohibited by Hashem, but is uh, a sin that desecrates the name of Hashem. That's why what Pincus did was very important in the eyes of Hashem because he defended, Pincus defended his name, the honor of his name. Amen. So Hashem rewards Pincus with a very long life. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, is believed that not only he uh, had a long descendant um, line of priests, but it's believed that he had from Hashem a long life. In fact, it's, uh, it has been told that he, was, he died, and but he, by tradition, he didn't even die. He died at the age of 400 years. But the same uh, figure has been encountered again in the Torah through the book of Shoftim, the book of Judges. And Pincus is retained as still alive through the spirit of Eliyahu Navi, the prophet Elijah. Okay, so in the Jewish tradition, uh, it's believed that he never died, so that his spirit has been alive until Eliyahu Navi, the prophet Elijah, has been living, and as we know, Elijah didn't die. So Eliyahu, a Navi, the prophet, is later taken up to heaven alive. So he didn't lie, he didn't die. And if we look at the book of Melachim of the kings, he will one day, as the Jewish tradition believe, soon blow the shofar that signals the coming of Moshiach. And this belief, it's really important for us as uh, Messianic Jews, because knowing what's the Jewish tradition belief, we can also uh, take something from this belief that let us understand what's the meaning of the spirit of Elijah that is believed that would come before the coming of Moshiach Yeshua. As we know, as, as Moshiach Yeshua came to earth, he was preceded by Yohanan, John the Baptist, at his age, at his uh, during his life. But at the second coming, we know that the Moshiach Yeshua will come again as Ben David, as the founder of his people, and he is going to be preceded by Eliyahu Anavi that is going to be represented by a person having the spirit of Eliyahu Anavi. Amen. So it's important to know this because it's important to watch every single detail of our times, knowing that spiritually it's something that is not going to be like we can imagine things. So what we see is not going to be like what we will see in the future. Spiritually, the heavens will open much more in the future than ever before. So we have to be prompt and ready to look through the eyes of the Ruach HaKadosh, of the Holy Spirit. Not by flesh, but by His Spirit. We have to look through the Ruach HaKadosh. And this is very important for believers because many will be defiled by the anti-Messiah who will be in, uh, interpreted and covered by a person who will tell everyone that he is the Moshiach.
but the true Messiah, the true Moshiach will come right after when everything will be built and after the anti Messiah will sit there in a temple, then the Moshiach will come. And it's important to know that everything we are facing during this period is in a good or in a bad way, a blessing for all of us. As it's written that for the ones which love Hashem, no matter what is coming, it will be always good for us. Because at the end, we know where we are going. We know that Hashem has promises above and beyond what the world is offering. So as well as for this guy, a normal guy, a, a kind of a common guy, Pinkas, he didn't have that kind of background. It was a mix of uh, idolatry from his mother's side and priesthood through his father's side. But he had the courage and zeal to act out what others didn't have the courage to. Even Moshe didn't have that courage. He called the others. He wanted to be uh, I would say, uh, politically correct. But sometimes Hashem uses us in a powerful way when no one else has courage to do things which are going to glorify his name. As we, we will see wars to come in Israel. And not many will be courageous and prompt to act as they are called to defend the name of Hashem. Many will be defiled and just find comfort in idolatry and in the falsehood and in the false messiah rather than fighting for uh, honoring Hashem through their lives until the end. So how does it work when we make a new coin? Let's see what's the process. Until now, only those grandsons born after Aaron became the coin gadol are to be coining but Pincus was born as we said before Aaron became the coin gadol is to remain a Levi Hashem rewards Pincus though by making him a coin so he doesn't have any background that justifies him to become a coin but it does become because of the will of Hashem. And we have to remember this case because we are a kingdom of priests and kings. Each one of us has a responsibility to honor the name of Hashem. And in his name, we have a responsibility to bring ourselves forward, Kadima. And forward means that we're going to act out in honor of Hashem without fear of men. Because men can do nothing to us. We have to have the fear of Hashem first. Because when we have the fear of Hashem, Hashem is going to praise us and give us the reward we are looking for. That is not the earthly reward, it is his kingdom of heaven. So Hashem rewards Pincus by making him a coin. At this point, no one can use the descended from idol worshiper theory on him anymore. Hashem also decrees that most of the coin Gedolim will descend from Pincus. During the time of the first Beit Amikdash, the one we are going to mourn during these three weeks before the Nine of Ab, 18 Koinim Gedolim were Pinchas' grandchildren, and 80 Koinim Gedolim descended from Pinchas during the second Beit Amikdash. So, making a move on Midian. Once Hashem finishes dealing the blows to the complainers and sinners and blessings to Pinchas, it's time to move on to the Midianite matters. Hashem lets Moshe know that Midian is an enemy. They are the startledly 
attempt to make Bnei Israel seen with the Midianite women is worse than murder. Furthermore, Midian is undoubtedly hoping may mad because the princess Godspeed was killed and they are plotting their revenge right now. In the next Parsha, though, with Hashem's help, Bnei Israel will take care of Midian. So let's tune in <laughs> next week. And now let's talk about counting. Between Bilam, Balak, and the Midianite women, many Jews have died from the plague. So now, as Bnei Israel prepares to cross into Eretz Israel, it's time to take stock of the nation. Moshe and Eleazar are put in charge of counting every man between the ages of 20 and 60. Once again, the Alf Shekel coin is the key to the count. Each candidate must contribute one Alf Shekel to the committee, and the Levihim are counted separately. Each Levite male from the age of one month and up is included. So what's the result of this counting? Let's look at the numbers, which are really important in the Torah. Eleazar tallies the figures from each Shevet, from each tribe, and comes up with 600 and 1,730, not much higher than the last census 40 years before. It means that throughout all these years in the desert, since they moved up to the um, almost the death of uh, Moshe, is going to die in a few months, nothing has changed. So we have among all the deaths and all the people which have been dying, the same number that started at the beginning of the going around the, in the wilderness for 40 years. So Shevet Shimon, the tribe of Shimon, has um, sustained the deepest drop because of idolatry and mixing with the Midianite women. From 59,300 men, it reduces to 22,000. Less than half of a number of a tribe has been dying throughout the 40 years of wilderness. While there is a very interesting number, uh, the recent plague brought on by the Midianite women is to be blamed. And the biggest increase is Shevet Menashe. Shevet Menashe is one of the two tribes coming from the tribe of Joseph. As we remember, Joseph was composed by two tribes, Menashe and Ephraim. And an honorable mention goes to Serach. In fact, the Menashe uh, tribe increases in number because of somebody remembered name Serach, the righteous daughter of Asher, who has survived since Yaakov and his family went down to Egypt. She will enter the promised land together with the Bene Israel and live on for many years. So, following the will of Hashem is not important just for our own life but for the future generations. That's why when we put ourselves into sinful path, into idolatry, into um, desecration of the name of Hashem, we not only are cursing ourselves, but we're cursing our future generations, which will pay the consequences of our actions. That's why it's important to reflect before doing anything and pray Hashem for guidance. No matter what is the circumstance we face, it's important to know that according to his will, everything we ask for is going to come to pass. If it, something that we ask is not going to be in his will, it's not going to come to pass anyway. But at least we have asked for it. So never despite the time of prayers, because when we pray, we prepare the territory before us so that Hashem is going to enlarge our tents and pour His Spirit upon us and answer 
to us in a powerful way above and beyond our imagination. I mean, so the deed goes to the daughters. This is very interesting for us girls. It's time to hand out the portion of land to the men of Bene Israel. This idea doesn't sit well with a family of five sisters from the tribe of Manashe. They are called Makla, Noha, uh, Chagla, Milka, and Tirza. Very interesting names. They feel they are being deputed out of land because of their father, Selafkad, has passed away and has left no sons. Since the land is passed down from father to son by tradition, still today, these women stand to lose their share of Eretz Israel, and women's leap takes on the land committee as, as these five daughters bring their case before Moshe. So they ask Moshe to allow them to inherit their father's portion. And furthermore, they want a double portion since their father was a firstborn. So Moshe consults with Hashem on this matter. As far as he understands, only sons can inherit the land, right? But Hashem tells Moshe that if a man has no sons, his daughters can inherit the land. So the daughters of Tzelafkad inherit a double portion of Eretz Israel. This means that the same rights which have been given, given to the firstborn son have been given to the daughters. Listen carefully to the scriptural references and use powerful in your prayers when speaking about your inheritance. And when we speak about the inheritance, uh, inheritance, we not only speak about the inheritance uh, as a money or finances, blessings or houses and belongings or properties, but we speak about spiritually inheritance. So as we are Hashem's sons and daughters, whatever is our father's inheritance is ours no matter what we ask for whatever is his is already ours but we have to keep asking whatever we ask in his will is going to be ours and as the daughters of Selafkad prayed as they received double portion we also can receive double portion of wisdom, of understanding, of the Holy Spirit gifts, of uh, powerful prayers, of studying and wisdom in the studying of a Torah. Whatever we ask, we are going to receive it because we are his sons and daughters. And we have already everything been prepared by Hashem. He just wants us to ask. So it shall be given. As every child, right? When we teach them to ask us, why do we do it? Because we want to listen to what they want to receive. And how they are going to ask is really important to us. Because we want to be sure that they have learned what we have taught them. So as parents, through this project, we are learning how to teach our children the inheritance we have received from Hashem to be passed to our children. Amen. Never despise times of little things because in small things we gather all the tools we need to be able to lead others to greater understanding, to greater uh, territories, to greater uh, and extraordinary miracles happening in our lives. But if we are not asking in the small places or in the small uh, things we are living today, we're not going to see the miracles which are already ready for us to see. Amen. So let's keep asking. Let's Let's keep praying. Let's keep knocking at that door that Yeshua is going to answer. 
and Hashem is going to bless our lives and open doors for us that no man can close and close those doors which are not meant to be opened, such as idolatry, sexual immorality, and all the things the world is imposing to us as part of the law right now. And this takes lots of courage, as Yehoshua needed. So let's look at Yehoshua. Yehoshua is the primary and uh, I would say the first student of Moshe, because Moshe had two sons, but at the same time, he had a, a great student. Yehoshua didn't have any family relationship with uh, Moshe, but he was a great student so remember when moshe hit the rock his dreams of entering eretz israel were dashed when hashem told him he would never set foot in the land of israel he would die instead in the desert as everybody else in his generation was as the jews prepare to enter eretz israel moshe realizes that the end is near he is concerned that the Bene Israel needs a leader to take his place. One who has courage and is wise. Moshe has two candidates in mind, his sons Gershom and Eliezer. But Hashem has other plans as always. He has always different plans from ours. So he's humble. He is learned. He's one of only two spies to bring back a good report about Eretz Israel. Introducing Yehoshua bin Nun, it's not easy. Hashem asks Moshe to appoint Yehoshua. His prize student. Moshe should tell Yehoshua how blessed he is to be chosen by Hashem to bring the nation into Eretz Israel. Something he, he was just uh, desiring from a long time. And first Moshe is to put his hands on Yehoshua's head to transfer his greatness. And what does it mean with the with imposing his hands upon the head of uh, Yehoshua, Moshe was transferring the anointing, yeah, as we, as a priesthood, the anointing by the Ruach HaKadosh, by the Holy Spirit, the power upon him. So it was not Moshe, but Moshe was the transfer, okay, he was used as a tool from Hashem through the Ruach HaKadosh, through the hands of Moshe to Yehoshua. So Yehoshua received the same anointing and priesthood and kingship of Moshe. Then Yehoshua has to speak to the nation uh, in Moshe's presence. That must be a difficult time to face for Moshe. But Moshe was a very humble person. That's why he was called to be the leader of Israel. And when Moshe approaches Yehoshua, Yehoshua turns down the position on grounds of humility. He says, no, 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 thank you. <laughs> but that only gives Moshe a stronger case. And Moshe, we know, doesn't have any kind of, a, you know, he doesn't accept a no <laughs> as an answer. He's very aggressive and uh, he uses that aggressivity uh, and aggressive behavior in a positive way. So spiritually, he uses his uh, imposition as uh, anointing and the kingship and, and priesthood onto the head of Yehoshua. And Moshe puts both hands on Yehoshua head. And the spirit of Hashem, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, flows from Moshe's fingertips into Yehoshua's body. It must have been beautiful just to see. And Yehoshua is now filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Ruach HaKadosh, with the wisdom, understanding all the gifts of the Holy Spirit to guide the Bnei Israel when Moshe is gone. 
Moshe teaches Yehoshua how to pronounce the holiest name of Hashem, not to be in trouble. He teaches Yehoshua the mysteries of the Torah. Moshe drapes Yehoshua in beautiful garments and brings him before the Bnei Israel. And now we have the starting of the day with a tamid. We wrap as uh, the Parsha with the laws of the Korban Tamid, the daily sacrifice, and the laws of the Korban Musa. Hashem commands that every morning, each day, the Kohanim will offer a lamb on the Mitzbayach, on the altar outside of the uh, Beit um, Amikdash or the tabernacle at the time. First, the lamb is lauded. Then the entire animal is burned as an ola together with the mincha, the flour offering, and nesek, the wine offering. In the afternoon, the konim offer the same lamb, flour, and wine combination. This is called the afternoon tamid. These korbanot are offered twice a day every day, including Shabbat. They are paid for with the alf shekels collected from the nation once a year. Therefore, at each offering, representatives of the community, of the Klal, Kohanim, Leviim, and all Israel are present as, as the Korban Tamid is offered. Then we have an extra Korban Masaf. Every day you got your standard tamid offerings in the morning, in the afternoon. But when it comes to Shabbat, Rosh Kodesh, Yom, uh, Yom Tov, the community, the Klal, chips in for an extra set of korbanot. In fact, Musaf means additional, as it's an additional offering. And there is a chart on the, the Vash magazine that shows you how every offering would work for each and every day and also each and every feast. And it's really interesting to see from this um, most of offerings, this additional, um, the additional offering, that there was a, a, a fixed number of bowl and ram and male goat, while the lamb only on Shabbat are the only two animals which are offered, while the others, bull, rams, and uh, goat, male goats, are not offered. During all the other feasts, all the other animals are offered and in high quantity. So they, they had lots of animals to be offered, especially on Sukkot, where every day, in uh, during Sukkot, fourteen lambs were sacrificed, and um, a, a variety of numbers uh, of bulls and rams, but many, many lambs. So let's look now at the korban rabba. The korbanot are so important that any malach needed to offer korbanot on Shabbat and Yom Tov is permitted. So Moshe tells the Bnei Israel that the laws of korbanot should be studied before Yom Tov to make sure that the right korbanot are offered. And these days, davening that comes from a Yiddish um, word, that means prayer that has been transferred to the Hebrew language and means prayer takes the place of this korbanot. In our tefillot or prayers, we add the musaf on Shabbat, Rosh Kodesh and Yom Tov, reciting verses from the Torah that mention these korbanot. And on Rosh Kodesh, we read the Torah portion that deals with the korbanot of Rosh Kodesh. When the Beit Amikdash is once again standing, 
the third temple, Corbana will be back in business. So it's important to know how it all works for future uh, information. Until then, it is up to all of Klal Israel, of all the community of Israel, to remember these holy rituals and the words from the Torah that we read in Musaf about the Korbanot are really powerful indeed. Speaking of the power of words, do not make any promises until you tune in next week for our exciting episode of the Bash magazine. And now let's look at the Midrash. As we always tell you, we pick up the Midrash as well as historical and traditional commentaries from the Jewish tradition as references to the Moshiach ben David, Yeshua HaMashiach, being seen through each and every uh, Torah and Midrash and commentaries references. We need to be informed about all sources so that we might discern which ones are the true ones, which ones are just referring to and interpreting in a, in a different way what is supposed to be. But it's important to know that through the commentaries, we always can bring something that gives us a gleam of heaven that gives us also a reference to the scriptural references we give from the Torah that lead to the Moshiach Yeshua. So the Parsha of Pinchas starts with, and Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Pinchas ben Alazar ben Aaron Achoanin. So Pinchas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen, turned my anger away from the children of Israel. Bechamo es kine asi. In that he was jealous for my sake and avenged my vengeance and this is uh from our weekly torah portion so i invite you to read the torah portion scriptures at a chapter 25 verses 10 and 11 and the end at the end of the last week parsha pinchas comes forward to sanctify Hashem's name and his merit, the terrible plague that was ravaging, uh, ravaging the camp of Ben Israel was stopped. So there are only five parsha in the Torah that bear the name of a person, and each teaches us a very important lesson about that person. In fact, it's interesting that this week's parsha is named for Pinchas, who was a very great tzaddik righteous men, while the Parsha right before this is called Balak, after the king of Moab, who wasn't a good person. Why? That's a different Midrash. <laughs> so you're going to look at the previous video from last week, and you can see or listen to it and understand why. There must be something significant that we can learn by comparing Pinchas to Balak. When Balak sensed that the Jewish people were threatening to destroy his nation, he did not spring into action, but rather stopped the Bnei Israel. And how did he try to do it? He hired other people. He didn't want to have you know the so-called dirty hands he didn't want to be involved into the dirty job and he hired Balaam a false prophet an idol uh prophet and the people of Midian to try to stop the Bene Israel and we see here what a lazy person Balak was on the contrary Pinchas was a doer and when there was a call for action, he immediately stepped in to do what had to be done. 
He didn't wait for someone else to come along and try to save his people. He felt the responsibility was his. So Pink has personified what Hillel as a chain, the elder, teaches as in Pirkei Avot, Perek number two, Mishnah number five. That says, Bemakom she ain enashim ish tadel lehiot ish. In a situation where there are no leaders, try to be the leader. So Pinchas ben Eleazar ben Aaron a Kohanim, Pinchas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the Kohanim. Why does the Torah need to list Pinchas hijos, so the lineage, all the way back to Aaron a Kohanim? Why? There is a good reason. There were some people in the Bnei Israel who weren't happy that Pinchas took revenge against Zimri in order to sanctify the name of Hashem. They therefore embarrassed him and poked fun at the fact that his mother was a descendant of Yitro, the father-in-law of Moshe, who was known to be a priest for idol worshippers before he converted to Judaism. So the Shevatim the tribes were suspicious of Pinchas, saying that he killed Zimri because the trait of cruelty was embedded in him from his idol-worshipping ancestors. So they were accusing him to kill the couple, sinful, clearly, in according to sin, just because he was led by idol-worshipping ancestors' spirits. And we remember this uh, also through the life of Yeshua HaMashiach as he preached and as he made miracle throughout his ministry of the three years of his uh, life between the 30 years of age and 33 years of age, he was always accused to be led by a Satan instead of a Shem, instead of the Ruach Kodesh. So we see how a Satan uses confusion and also people within the community do, to accuse us when we do something in the name of a Shem. So do not be surprised to be judged by the same people which are supposed to support you in serving Hashem. Because Hashem cho choses, um, chose us because of our heart and not because of other people's opinion about us. As we know, when we do the will of Hashem, there will be always somebody coming to us saying that what we do is not very right in the eyes of the flesh, in the eyes of the society around us. So therefore, the Torah wanted to focus on Pinchas' great-grandfather. He spoke about Aaron Achoanin, who was known to be a person who ran after shalom, after peace. In fact, the Torah says, Oaif shalom verodaif shlomo, shlom. And the Torah traces the lineage of Pinchas back to Aaron about from uh, whom Hillel said in Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, verse 12, be of the disciples of Aaron, loving peace and pursuing peace, loving people and bringing them closer to the Torah. That's what we are called to do. That's what we are called to share. Shalom, peace. But peace doesn't come always through uh, accepting everything around us and saying that everything everybody does is right in the eyes of Hashem. That's false doctrine. That's false love. So it's important to speak by the Ruach HaKadosh, to speak in, in honor of Hashem, despite what men can think about us because ultimately our fear is of the Lord 
not of man. And we're looking forward to meet him in heaven. We're not looking forward to meet men on earth since we're already here, but we're not called to be here. We're called to be in heaven with Hashem at his presence who will make us accountable of every single action, thought, and word we did during our lives. Let's get ready for that. Pincus inherited this trait from Aaron, and when he took revenge for Hashem, it was only in order to restore peace, to restore shalom and the honor of Hashem. As we pray, let's pray for our families and our klal. Abinu Malkenu, our father, our king, we ask you for unity in the klal of Israel, no matter what the denomination and the differences among us. We ask you for redemption for all Israel to be saved. In the name of Moshiach Yeshua, Amen. Father, we also ask you for strength, for courage, for um, boldness, for chutzpah. In the name of Moshiach Yeshua, to be prompt, ready to stand before you, knowing that whatever we have done, we have done it in your name and to honor your name, to lift your name high, higher than any other name. In the name of Moshiach Yeshua, Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom to all of you. And please write to us, um, contact us for any questions, also for counseling sessions. We're always available, both online and in person, uh, both in Italian and in English, um, partially in Spanish. We can try the best as we can, as the best we can. And uh, so Shavua Tov to all of you and blessings in Moshiach Yeshua. Amen.